Hi, I'm Femi OK. Today on the stream, we are going to dig a little bit deeper into three news stories affecting the Occupy West Bank. Now, I know you will have opinions. Put your comments into YouTube and you can share, and I will share some of them with our guests. Let's meet the guests. Hello to Fatima, Anshal and Omar. Really nice to have you on today's stream. Fatima, introduce yourself, tell our audience who you are and what you do. Hi, my name is Fatima Abdul Karim. I'm a journalist. I'm based in Ramallah in Palestine. I've been covering the region um, or covering basically Palestine mm -hmm. for the past 15 years. I've recently joined the fabulous team of um, a Christian Science Monitor, and I'm very happy to be joining you today at Al Jazeera into English. Oh, so happy to have you. Anshal, welcome to the stream. Introduce yourself to our global audience. Well, my name is Anshal Vora. Thanks very much for having me on the show. I'm a journalist based in Beirut. I'm also a columnist for Foreign Policy magazine. I write uh, on the Middle East uh, uh, about the region, essentially, and uh, recently have of course, also been writing on the Israel-Palestine conflict. So nice to have you. Thank you for making time for us. And Omar, welcome home. Omar is an alum from the stream. It's so nice to have you. Omar, now you have a different role. Tell everybody who you are and what you do. I know it's interesting to be here on the other side of this, but I am Omar Badar. I'm a Palestinian-American political analyst based in Washington, D.C. And in addition to offering analysis, I also some, do some work on advocacy for a change in American mm. policy towards Palestine and Israel. Well, good to have you back on the stream. So we are going to start guests in the occupied East Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah. Fatima, I'm going to start with you. That was uh, East Jerusalem on Monday. Uh, one of our Al Jazeera producers posted that video. For me, it tells me that the news doesn't stop in East Jerusalem. It may not be the first news story. It may not even be in the headlines, but it continues. What does that video tell you? This video is about the daily life uh, for Palestinians all across the Palestinian territories. Uh, everywhere they live, there is this threat of... Uh, um, it's either settler sanctioned, uh, settlers uh, attacking Palestinians that are sanctioned by, uh, go unpunished basically by the state, uh, or it is the Israeli military or the Israeli police. Um, for me, this video is, is, a, is a picture of daily life for Palestinians who feel at risk every moment of their lives, every day. They feel the risk not only of eviction, but also harming their personal security uh, at their own homes. Um, the, the, the periphery of your own personal space is at, is at risk, and it's highly uh, a, a volatile situation where um, Israeli uh, police or Israeli authorities do nothing uh, to prevent uh, this the, this situation. So it's not just that the news doesn't stop, it's the daily conflict mm. um, for Palestinians who are trying to say that we just want to live here, uh, that uh, who are being attacked by either settlers or Israeli authorities and their different bodies every single day. I have witnessed that. Mm -hmm. Angel, can you even tell the story of the protests in East Jerusalem? Is there a, a week when, when one set of protests happen and a week when another set of protests happen? Is there a narrative that you can even follow, Angel? Well, I think there are sort of two important things that I'd like to mention here, also picking up from what Fatima said. Uh, there is obvious discrimination and systematic discrimination at play. If you look at the events of just the last 
uh, 15 days or so, or just the last month when the recent clashes, clashes between uh, Hamas and uh, Israeli forces uh, took place. We saw that the Israeli forces arrested a lot of Palestinians, and they said that they were arresting rioters, quote unquote, uh, and not protesters, which is what Palestinians on the ground have claimed, uh, or people who were arrested. And we know there were activists like Mohammed al Kurd uh, and his sister Mona al Kurd who actually were just protesting to save their homes, who were also picked up. But when, after the ceasefire was agreed upon, when the Israeli authorities under the new prime minister, Naftali Bennett, allowed for the flag march uh, to be uh, uh, carried out by the Israelis and many of them ultra-Orthodox Jews as well, we heard them chant death to Arabs and these are sort of despicable things to say and, and offensive to anybody who hears uh, such chants, even if, you're, even if you're not an Arab. But we did not sort of hear of Israel making any arrests then. So this is, it's sort of obvious that there is systematic discrimination at play. And I don't know what uh, my co-panelists uh, think about Naftali Bennett being the new prime minister, but I suspect, and I've been talking to a lot of Palestinian intellectuals who fear that it might actually get worse. Mm. We are going to get to that. Omar, I want to play a video to you, and then I'd love to hear your response at the end of it. This is Dahlia. She's an independent journalist. She's talking about Sheikh Jarrah. This is her take. I'm going to hear your take just after you hear it. The Israeli authorities have also effectively cordoned off this eastern part of um, uh, Sheikh Sharrah. Uh, they're saying they're trying to de-escalate things, but effectively what's happening is that um, supporters of, uh, Palestinian, of Palestinians in the neighborhood are not being allowed in, uh, yet um, Israeli uh, settlers and supporters uh, uh, and their supporters are being allowed into the neighborhood. What this has meant is is that um, uh, Israeli authorities are trying to uh, suppress the mass mobilization uh, that has uh, uh, has been sparked be, uh, because of what's happening in Sheikh Sharrah. Look, what Dalia is saying is is absolutely spot on. And I think to take a quick step back and set the context for this a little bit more. When we are talking about East Jerusalem, we are talking about occupied Palestinian territory that Israel has no right to be in. And yet Israel is effectively the authority. They are there by force. And they've created a reality in which they really have an ethnic cleansing project. That is effectively what we are witnessing. Um, international law is very clear about the fact that you cannot throw people who are unoccupied people out of their homes in occupied territory in order to bring a segment of the occupier's population to live in their homes. And that is precisely what Israel's policy is. Um, the deputy mayor of Jerusalem admits to it openly. Arya King is the person I'm referring to, who basically says that the policy, Israeli policy in East Jerusalem, is to reduce the number of Palestinians and increase the number of Israeli Jews in order to achieve demographic dominance in East Jerusalem. And we're looking at Sheikh Zarrah, we are really looking at a situation in which the indigenous people who belong in those homes are afforded, are essentially living under all kinds of restrictions and violence, and yet right. the Israeli settlers, who are intruders in Sheikh Jarrah, enjoy complete and total freedom of movement. It really is a situation of apartheid. There is no other way to describe it. And every major human rights organization has been very clear about the fact that Israel imposes apartheid rule on Palestinians in which they don't enjoy the same so Omar, rights as Israelis. So, Omar, I've got Alex G, who's on YouTube. And Alex says, what reactions should major Western countries be having to the issue currently in Sheikh Jarrah? Should they directly be getting involved, commenting with the situation? You have 30 seconds to respond to that. Absolutely. I mean, look, it's really no different than what's happening in South Africa or that happened in South Africa during the apartheid era. Mm -hmm. What is really needed from the international community is an imposition of sanctions, is creating consequences for Israeli racist policies that impact Palestinians in order to ensure that they do not continue enjoying Western support, at least. I mean, that we certainly see that a lot of this is happening All in right. terms of American aid and, and, and diplomatic protection, that should not be happening and there should be consequences for All right, this. Alex, you had your answer there from Omar. I, I want to move on because Anshul brought this up. In Israel, where a new coalition government has um, been uh, signed in, um, sworn in, this is the Prime Minister, Naftali Bennett, at his very first cabinet meeting. This happened on June the 13th. Take a look. <laughs> We are at the beginning of new days. The hardships, not exaggerated word in this case, of forming a unity government are behind us. And now, 
The citizens of Israel, all of them, are looking up at us and we must deliver. So I'm, I'm just looking at my laptop, Anto, a story that you wrote for uh, Al Jazeera. Dot com. Will Israel's Bennett be worse than Bibi for Palestinians? Asked the question. Did you did you ask that question? Was it a genuine question? Did you already know the answer, Anshul? Go ahead. Well, I suspect. I, I mean, I think I knew the answer. But yeah. as a journalist, you sort of have to approach it in a way that you know. I mean, of course, there are a lot of other people who've been working on this topic for much longer, and I had to speak to them. And uh, uh, Palestinian intellectuals, you know, uh, 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 they were pretty honest in their assessment, and they said, look, there are several scenarios that could play out. One is that nothing happens because Bennett is going to be prime minister for two years, and the coalition that he's heading is very fragile, and they don't really want to rock the boat, so why talk about Palestinians anyway? And if you do go to Israel, you see that inside Israel, Palestinians and their well-being is sort of not an issue. It's a non-issue. They have their internal issues, and that's what they talk about. One possibility is, is is that nothing happens. But the other possibility is that Mr. Bennett actually carries out the policy that he's always promised to carry out, which is pro-settlement, uh, which is against a two-state solution. And what uh, uh, worries a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, Palestinian thinkers is that this prime minister has actually said that he wants to go on, carry out more illegal settlements, and he actually thinks that there is a Palestinian state. He thinks that Israel has already given Palestinians a state in the form of Gaza. And he claims 60% of the West Bank, all of Area C, if you know after the Oslo Accords, uh, Palest uh, Pal uh, occupied West Bank was sort of seen Area A, B, and C. He claims all of Area C. So uh, if, if you now look at just the last week and all the things that, have, that the Israeli government has cleared, uh, they've cleared the demolition of the house of a man that they said attacked Israelis. Uh, collective punishment, again, imposing against the family of that man, even if that man, you know, did commit the crime that the Israeli authorities uh, are saying that, uh, that, that he did. Uh, the second thing that they've done is, for the first time in six months, they've cleared construction in West Bank. Now, we do know that the Biden administration had asked Netanyahu for an unofficial freeze on illegal settlements. But now, just today, they, it was reported in Israeli papers that a construction ban has been lifted. So we already sort of see these moves, and one wonders if Mr. Bennett is actually going to be worse than even Bibi, if that's even, you know, possible. Uh, I'm just going to bring in Fatima. Fatima, there, there's... Um a researcher and journalist called Dahlia Masri, and she's wrestling with the idea of, so what does this new government even mean? Here's her take, and then come off the back and share yours. Essentially, a new government doesn't actually mean anything to Palestinians because every Israeli government has been worse than the other, um, and Palestinians know too well that liberation won't be achieved by a specific government. You know, the problem isn't just that. The problem is the whole entire state-run settler colonial project. And, you know, Naftali Bennett himself wants to expand Jewish settlements and annex more land in the West Bank, which is going to be even worse for Palestinians than we've already seen today. We've seen this in Sheikh Jarrah and in Beta, the South of Nablus. So Palestinians need the end of occupation, they need liberation, lifting the siege on Gaza, the right of return for all refugees, and that's not going to be achieved by asking your occupier to free you. Well, I think that Dalia has a point here in saying that there is not really, it's not a question who is in power in Israel. It's a, it's a question of who, what is this power or what is this person willing to do? Are they willing to undo uh, laws that institutionalize discrimination against Palestinians, whether they are Palestinians uh, who are citizens of Israel, whether Palis they are Palestinians who are given the um, uh, status of permanent refugees, quote unquote, inside uh, East Jerusalem or Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza, because what we're seeing here is the same uh, discrimination, the same end goal, but at different levels, whether it's the pro police brutality, the housing situation inside Israel, uh, the, uh, uh, the discrimination and the ethnic cleansing inside Jerusalem, uh, as is as described by international uh, human rights organizations, or the ethnic cleansing in Area C, which is over 60 percent, as Angela said, um, of the West Bank. So the question is, are they willing to undo 
or how are they handling the legacy that they inherited from mm. Bibi Netanyahu's tenure in, 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 in about 12 years? The decade of Netanyahu has just ended. And how Fat are they Fatima, going can to I ask that? Can, can you ask that question to Omar and see what Omar has to say? Omar, go ahead, pick up. No, really. What do you Fatima, think, Omar? What do you think? Uh -huh. Sure. Really, what you're describing is really spot on. I mean, when we're looking at Benjamin Netanyahu or Naftali Bennett or anybody else, the changes matter to Israeli politics in a domestic sense. But when it comes to their relationship to Palestinians, really nothing will fundamentally change. We are looking at two prime ministers that changed from Netanyahu to Bennett who believe in Israeli apartheid. That is their platform. They believe in settler expansion, settlement expansion throughout the Palestinian territories. They believe in not in denying Palestinians their rights, and they don't really see Palestinians as equal human beings who are deserving of the same rights that Israelis enjoy. That's fundamentally the issue. I mean, really, the difference is, is that Bennett is even more overtly racist than Netanyahu. Netanyahu was warning about Arabs voting in droves during the election and engaging in all kinds of anti-Arab rhetoric, mm -hmm. and Bennett takes that up takes that to the next level. He bragged about killing Arabs and saying he sees no problem with it. He favors killing Palestinian prisoners rather than taking them prisoners. He talks about how Palestinians were, quote unquote, swinging from trees when Jews already had a state and were civilized. That's the extent of the racism that we're dealing with. And the fact that you still Omar, have this rhetoric. Uh, if, I, mm -hmm. if I may, Omar, you know, since you are in Washington, D.C., how do you see Biden administration actually sort of gearing up to deal with it, if they do intend to deal with this uh, intractable issue at all. Because we've sort of seen, after the recent clashes, that, you know, they sort of said both things, that we want Palestinians to be secure, but it's also, we also want Israeli secure, Israelis to have a right to launch airstrikes to maintain their own security. You know, there, how do you see sort of which direction is Biden administration going to move? Because I think that's key. Absolutely. Look, I think the Biden administration is trying to bury its head in the sand when it comes to this issue. They want to pay lip service to the rhetoric of peace and equality and equal rights and freedom for everyone. But when it comes to actual policy, I think they are, would rather avoid placing meaningful consequences on Israeli policy. They want to pretend that the reality that we're all describing at this point is not actually the case and to just talk about perpetual negotiations. But clearly, fundamentally, nothing will change until there is a change in American policy on this. Because when we talk about the U.S. giving $3.8 billion every single year to Israel and offering endless vetoes of the United Nations mm -hmm. to shield Israel from accountability, then there's not going to be incentive for the Israeli government to change its behavior. And so when you see these mobs yeah, but... taking the streets in Jerusalem and elsewhere, chanting death to Arabs, growing in numbers and becoming more brazen, that's really a reflection of the fact that Israeli politics is shifting more and more to the right. And there doesn't seem to be an acknowledgement from Washington, although that is changing here in the United States, because there are incre increasingly progressive members of Congress in the United States and celebrities who so are guess. willing to speak up and place meaningful pressure on Biden to change. So, so, guess, we, so guess we have we have some 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 comments on YouTube that I want to put to you so that you can discuss with our audience as well. And I'm going to squeeze in one more story. This is a story that asks what happens to a Palestinian town when an illegal settlement moves in. I want you to have a look at this video from an Israeli settlers group and then Omar, you come off the back of it, please. Welcome to the new settlement of Evyatar. We try time and again, but we finally returned to this hill and we returned with a lot of strength with many, many families. 40 families are already waiting to settle this land that has been waiting for us for 2,000 years. In order for this to happen, we need you to join us in this important mission. So, Omar, there are some basic details that are missing from that video. We only showed a clip, I watched the whole video, and there's some very basic details that are missing. Tell our audience what is missing from that video. That is a promotional video Certainly. that's saying, come, come live here. It's a beautiful place to live. What is missing? Look, every single settlement that Israel builds in the occupied Palestinian territories is illegal under international law. And this particular settlement, Ivyatar, is even illegal under Israeli law. The Israeli government has not authorized the settlement to be built. And it's built over the farmland of a Palestinian town called Beta that is just south of Nablus. And even though the settlement it does not, is not authorized even under the Israeli government, yet when Palestinians protest the presence of these settlers on their land, that this land theft that is unfolding, the Israeli military shows up and shoots at the Palestinian demonstrators. And in just the past few weeks, 
They've already killed at least five people who are demonstrating in Beta, including two children. A 15-year-old and a 16-year-old were also shot uh, and killed for protesting land theft that is actually illegal under Israeli law. So it's, it's really hard to describe how infuriating the situation is, where it doesn't really matter um, that the land theft is not approved by the Israeli government. They're still willing to defend it by crushing any Palestinian resistance to that, including with lethal force that targets children. It's, it's really unacceptable, and it's, it's a shame that the international community does not really react in a more forceful way that rises to the occasion, to the magnitude of the crimes that we're seeing unfolding. All right. So, guess you are so... Um so so plugged in to what is happening and impacting occupied uh, West Bank that I want to ask you questions on behalf of our audience. This is a speed round. I need your immediate thoughts and fast. This is Brad. Fatima, this is for you. How likely is it to work in a settlement concept based on duplexes occupied by Israeli and Palestinian families? Is that even possible? Fatima, go ahead. I don't think that uh, the issue of coexistence is uh, relevant to Palestinians now. Palestinians have been living in this dichotomy of uh, mm. uh, either or uh, for so long, either or a one state or two state, mm. uh, a peaceful resistance or armed resistance, uh, uh, re right of return or compensation. This is no longer relevant especially okay. to the new generation whose voices are, are right, heard. Share this. The, the coexistence is a myth. Anja um, is frowning. It's, proved. it's the speed round. We're moving on. Anja, why are you frowning? Yeah. Articulate the frown. Go ahead. No, well, I, uh, I agree with Fatima, but I also sort of, you know, feel that it's, uh, it's a really tense atmosphere, mm -hmm. uh, especially in homes where Palestinians and Jewish settlers have been forced, I would say, to live together. And we've seen that in, mm -hmm. you know, so many videos that have been published by Palestinians in East Jerusalem and in West Bank. And you can sort of sense the tension and your heart yeah. goes out for both people, really, to see that these, they should be having a good time together as neighbors. But actually, there is a lot of tension. And right. why wouldn't there be, you know, because, I mean, somebody starts to live in my house, I'm bound to be upset with them. Oh, that's an understatement. Here's Yusuf in, on YouTube. Yusuf says, this, this one is for you, Omar, um, no one is going to act. Like, we, we, we've done all these stories. You've seen the pictures. You've seen the pain. The West will always support its Israel ally. That is a huge generalization. Omar, you've got 30 seconds. Reply. I think things are beginning to change. They are changing very slowly. It's infuriating that you have this level of support. But I think now increasingly, for the first time ever during this latest assault on Gaza, progressive members of Congress were taking to the House floor denouncing Israeli apartheid and demanding a change. I think there is an awakening. I think people are becoming more aware. And as that awareness grows, there is going to be more and more pressure on governments to shift their policies. So I'm optimistic about the fact that a change oh, is eventually coming. Interesting. This is Assad. Fatima, I'm going to give Assad's question to you. Thank you for watching, Assad. What can be a practical solution to end this Israeli style of apartheid? Wow, that's a sort of Nobel laureate sort of question. <laughs> can you answer it, Fatima? What is the solution? Well, I think that uh, for Israel to uh, manage its policy level is essential to it is essential to dismantle everything uh, that ha that brings back that bring backs up race against democracy. So uh, if if there is any solution, it has to be with equality for all residents and eventually uh, um, the, all citizens enjoy uh, human rights. Right. All right, an easy one, an easy final one for you, Anchal. This is Taslima. What should be the stance of the Palestinian Authority regarding Naftali? Oh, well, I think first the Palestinian Authority must uh, start to speak up more for the Palestinians and try and uh, have some sort of a truce with Hamas, because as long as that's not the case, the Israelis are always going to be using their division as an excuse to not sit on the table and even talk about peace. There's stance towards Naftali should be a tough one. Mm -hmm. uh, Naftali does not actually recognize them as, as a proper uh, a, a government. He says they've got some sort of an autonomy, and that's as far as I'm ready to go. Uh, there's not going to be a state for Palestinians in West mm -hmm. Bank, and they already have one in Gaza. So I would imagine that their policy towards Naftali should be a tough one, but they should try to get 
are yes. some sort of a truce working with Hamas and get and Biden on their side to start the talks. She did a good job with that really tough question. YouTubers, your questions were excellent. Thank you for co-hosting with me today. My former co-host, Omar, thank you. So lovely to have you back on the stream. Anchel, Fatima, big topics. You wrestled with them so well. Thank you so much for being on the stream today. Appreciate you. I will see you next time. Take care, everybody.